hope everyone is uh, a historian at heart, uh, if not something that they practice every day. Uh, my talk is called OSM versus Blockchain to tell the historical mapping story. And I'll admit up front that that's a bit of a tease. And it's not just because I've thrown in a buzzword to grab your attention, but more because uh, this is not a contest between two different types of systems. It's all about uh, picking the best tool to best answer the question uh, that's at hand and uh, being able to tell the best story. And that's what uh, uh, being a historian is all about, is telling uh, the best story you can with the data that's available. And so what I've uh, been trying to do uh, recently is explore new ways to uh, do history using uh, technologies or systems like blockchain uh, and complementing uh, OSM or other sources of uh, spatial and historical data uh, to tell those kinds of stories. So speaking of stories, let me tell you a little story about myself. Something that I spend quite a bit of time on uh, in my life is working on a project to uh, come up with an architectural and social history of the neighborhood of Brooklyn Heights in Brooklyn, in New York City. Uh, this is a neighborhood that's over 200 years old. It's one of the oldest neighborhoods in uh, New York uh, that has uh, most of its buildings surviving. Uh, some of the questions that I've been trying to answer, because they haven't previously been answered for some works of New York City civic history uh, of why no one's really looked into this are when were some of these buildings built? Who lived in them? Uh, what were they doing there? Uh, why did some buildings change their uses over time? Why was this building that is in the center uh, a blacksmith shop 180 years ago and when did it change into someone's house? Uh, who are all these people listed in these old city directories that are called Cartman and, um, and other occupations that are no longer in vogue? Um, who are all of these people represented by these little scratches on the census record uh, who sometimes don't even have names, uh, but sometimes have, even though their names are not recorded, sometimes other categories are recorded, like their, uh, the color of their skin. Uh, so I've been trying to, to come up with some answers to these questions. And in the course of that, uh, because what I'm looking at is a neighborhood, I've been trying to spatially organize uh, this data. And as it turns out, coming up with a spatial representation of old data is not very easy. There are not a whole lot of tools that let you connect the dots um, in a way that you can come up with a compelling and accurate story. Um, now, this is not something that uh, I'm the first person to discover. If you've been an attendee at State of the Map before, you would have seen in 2015 a talk on this topic, in 2013 a talk on this topic, 2012, 2010, I think this is 2008. So, you know, th this is a problem that interests a lot of people, and a lot of uh, smart people have been trying to come up with different solutions of how you uh, spatially represent uh, data that spans uh, uh, the course of hundreds of years, potentially, that encompasses uh, land areas that have changed over time, uh, street grids have changed, streets get mapped, streets get demapped, shorelines have changed, buildings get built, they get demolished, new buildings come up in their place. Uh, you know, how do you take all of the data about those events and those places and those people that have changed over time? Uh, and you know, what do you do with it to look at it in one place without having to uh, wrap your mind in circles to, to go around it. Uh, so with that, I think, you know, I think part of the problem uh, that 
people encounter when they try to come up with a framework for looking at uh, historical data is that um, there's not a, a, a consensus about what we're even talking about when we're talking about time. Time uh, often gets uh, broken up into chunks depending on what people want to use it for. So, for example, when we talk about the past, the past is purely a frame of reference. The past can be what happened in the last hour, it can be what happened in the last year, it can be happen what happened in the last century. And what's relevant to you in one frame of reference might not be relevant to someone else. And you know, similarly, what, however you define the past can also uh, uh, inform how you define the present. So um, if you have a framework that is taking data and presenting it, um, or is designed to present uh, something that's called real-time data, uh, what may be real-time to you may not be real-time to someone else. If, the, if it's relevant to you, if there's a pizzeria on the corner uh, and that pizzeria was there five minutes ago, that might be suitable for your purpose. But what happens if you want to know if it was there a week ago or a month ago or you know, a decade ago? Uh, it totally depends on what your frame of reference is and how you're scaling time. And a lot of the, uh, this is a problem of data analysis in general and for cartography in, in uh, general, that that time element has been collapsed often uh, because it's either not necessary to present uh, time as a variable or um, Sometimes the underlying data is not really available to uh, accurately show different parts of time or changes over time, uh, or sometimes it's simply the designer's uh, um, conclusion that's easier to come up with a system that ignores it. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a combination of all of those. So if you look at uh, the way much of OSM is organized, for example, th there is um, an emphasis and a preference for what we perceive as real time or something close to it, um, but that is definitely not the only data that's out there and it's not the only data that we often want to look at. Um, and a problem that's related to the question of time and what's your reference and your scale of time is the concept of uh, places and how you distinguish between places. Uh, a lot of the reference frameworks that we have, uh, that we use today, are uh, with this uh, conceit of a base layer, and then you have your variable data that's layered on top of that. But what happens if you're trying to look at how a neighborhood has changed over time? Which map do you pick as your base layer? Do you pick uh, the map on the left? Uh, this is Brooklyn Heights in around 1800. You pick the map on the right, which is Brooklyn Heights around 1850, uh, or do you get a modern map? Uh, this is uh, a 20th century tax lot map. You know, if you want to look at a building that might have been located in a particular place, uh, how are you going to stick it on uh, the map if the street doesn't even exist in a particular time period? So there have been, you know, there's a lot of different uh, applications out there and services to uh, examine historical data, um, whether it's photos or other assets. Here are three examples of historical photo um, viewing type platforms. Uh, the one on the left is 80s.nyc that Brandon and uh, I worked on. Uh, the one in the middle is the Urban Archive app that has uh, a collection of uh, photo sources from different archives in New York City, uh, from the New York Public Library, the New York Historical Society, and others. Uh, the right is oldnyc.org, which Dan Vanderkam developed a few years ago uh, using New York Public Library uh, assets. All three of them uh, have the idea that there are these archival photo assets out there that people are really interested in looking at. Uh, they're sitting in these collections. There was no way to uh, navigate them spatially. They were just 
you know, dumped in a, a repository. So, you know, people have come up with ways to represent them on a map. Sometimes you had to first geotag uh, some of the assets. Other times they were already geo-referenced, but in a, a scheme that didn't really link up to uh, a modern map that you could display. Um, but in all of them, you run into problems where the photo doesn't match up to something that's on the current street map. Uh, in the middle photo, this is a street in Brooklyn Heights, uh, a photo of this street called Poplar Street. There used to be all of these houses until the 1950s when Robert Moses came through and knocked them all down to build an expressway. So you can see the expressway on the current map at the top of that uh, iPhone uh, screen grab. The location where that photo is taken from shows up as the red dot, which used to be a street, now it's a park next to the highway. On the right, that same exact photo in old NYC uh, got uh, mapped to the closest existing uh, street, uh, which is even less uh, uh, satisfactory because not only do you not know where it is today, but you don't know where it was before either. Uh, and on the left in 80s NYC, this is a, a neighborhood in downtown Brooklyn where uh, a big office complex was developed in the 80s, uh, the late 80s, right after the photo archive that we used was um, taken from. And uh, uh, you run into problems of where are some of these buildings that have been knocked down? How do you locate them on the map? So with all of that said, in terms of these problems of uh, trying to figure out what to do with old data and put it into a context that's usable for someone today. Um, I've been working a lot uh, in other parts of my life with people who are working on blockchain technology. And some of them have been describing things that they've been doing in the uh, area of uh, real property. Uh, people are trying to come up with systems to uh, track the ownership of, of land and buildings through blockchain systems. And that got me to thinking that one of the research uh, tools that I use uh, in my historical research is I look at old deeds, old property records. Uh, these are the exact same ones that people are trying to put on blockchain systems today to create a, um, a more secure, a faster, more efficient way to uh, track property ownership. Those systems... Uh, of tracking property ownership exists today in paper. Sometimes they're uh, digital, but they're not digital contracts. They're just um, digitized contracts. And uh, what I've been trying to um, uh, uh, develop is a system that applies those principles and uh, brings it uh, and applies it to the old data that's out there. Um, and so, as part of that, I've been looking at some other uses of blockchain that people are doing today, and because it, uh, uh, I'm trying to get as many new ways of um, ingesting this old data uh, into contemporary systems and speed up the uh, the, uh, the creation or the recreation or the ingestion of that data, and looking for for, for shortcuts to uh, to do that. Uh, so. Looking at some of the ways that people are using blockchain today, uh, on the left, these are the property systems that I mentioned. Um, in the middle, another area that people have been applying uh, blockchain and or crypto to is um, uh, how do you create better incentives to uh, put uh, places of interest, points of interest or place data uh, into systems uh, like OSM. And then on the right, uh, here are some other uh, systems that are analogs to some of the uh, conceits of blockchain of chaining data together uh, to track uh, changes over time and to uh, create um, a trusted uh, source of data that changes over time. Now, I'll talk just for a second about the incentives. Uh, you know, I think one, uh, among some of the many problems that exist with current uh, systems to look at historical data uh, from a spatial perspective is just getting the data 
into your spatial system. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, open historical map, there, you know, compared to OSM, you know, it's just a much uh, less used and adopted system. Uh, and so, if there was a incentive-based way to get much more of the data, historical data, into something like OSM, you know, that would be a big leap forward. The problem is I'm not sure that um, a crypto incentive system is really going to work for historical data. I'm not sure that the systems are, uh, or the incentives are really the same for historical data. And um, the other potential issue is that the, uh, the trust, the level of trust that you want to have high quality place data in a so-called real-time system is not really necessary uh, to the same degree in a historical system. And for that reason, I think uh, a community approach to coming up with trust, to arriving at a trust uh, is probably sufficient. Having said that, um, that doesn't mean that blockchain is uh, off the hook. Because if you look at the, um, the system of, of deeds that certainly exists in the United States, and if you look at other ways to organize land ownership uh, records in other countries, whether it's a land registry system uh, or a recording system, as long as you can get the underlying uh, registry data uh, that is um, geographically uh, tied, if you can uh, get that data accurately into your system and then track the changes in the data over time, you're gonna have a very good system of recreating what uh, land used to look like. So as an example, here's a deed from uh, 1810. It was actually recorded in 1842, but uh, it's dated 1810. You'll see at the top, uh, it's time stamped. And it's not just dated with the, the day of the year, but actually it's, it goes down to the minute. Someone, even in, uh, for legal reasons, it was necessary even in 1810 to record the minute of the day that uh, this deed was recorded. It has the um, uh, data that can be chained. It has a grantor, that's the person who was transferring the land, and it has the grantee, that the person who was taking title to the land. You can string those chains of grantor and grantee from property transaction to property transaction uh, to create a verifiable a link of how a particular piece of land uh, changed over time. And then at the bottom, it has bounded geodata. It has a description of the land that uh, that's the subject of this deed, uh, measured to the foot and by reference to some other landmarks. You can do this with other data sets, not just uh, land records that are in the form of deeds. Uh, in New York City at least, and I suspect in many other cities, there are uh, city maps that have that same type of verifiable uh, change to what the street grid looked like. Uh, so on the left, this is the same uh, area in Brooklyn Heights that we've seen in some of the other maps, but this is the record that's maintained by uh, the borough of Brooklyn, where every time since the beginning base map was created in 1817, uh, every time a change was made to any street in Brooklyn, someone by hand would make a notation on this map. It's a change log map. You can see the red where streets were added. There was a street, it's, I don't know if you can see on the screen because of the uh, contrast. There was a street that the name changed. Someone crossed out the name and wrote in a new name. There are streets that have been widened and the dimensions of the new street are added in a different color. You can see in the, corner, the bottom right corner that the expressway came in through in the 1950s and uh, lopped off a corner of that block. Now, the, thanks to uh, some people at New York City Planning Labs, They've digitized a lot of these maps, and you can um, get better access to them. But the real goal here is not just digitization of these old maps. It's 
digitization and ingestion of the change data, the metadata that's contained uh, on those maps. And once you uh, take that, uh, you don't need to take a map of 1850 or 1950 or whatever and sit there and trace the um, street lines on it. You will have a contemporary and hyper accurate record of what the dimensions of the street were before the change and after the change. And you can then recreate a, um, a map of whatever time period you want uh, based on that data. Now, a problem with this is that you have to watch out for gaps in your data. The whole point is that to be able to pick the time period you want without having to have already cherry picked uh, particular static maps uh, or static data sets, you need to see, you need to have accurate duration data. A lot of data sets that um, have some kind of geo component to them, uh, like for example, this is a record of newspaper articles. Uh, these are classified ads that mention different properties where people are trying to uh, either sell things or this example is a dance school. Um, you need to know not just when it happened, but when it started and when it ended. In these classified ads, they ran the same ad in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle for about two months in a row every single day. So if, you're, if you took the raw data, if, if you were able to you know, extract the OCR data of this and take the place uh, data out of that and associate it with the place name and use there, you'd still have a ton of data spanning this two month period or it could be a five month period or whatever period is depending on you know how the data sorts out uh, but what you really care about is when did that dance studio start in that location and when did it stop in that location and when did the use change to something else or were there multiple uses etc you don't care about the fact that they paid for a classified ad for two months at a time so through machine learning what i've been doing is uh analyzing uh, those types of data repetition to create much more accurate and validated duration data. And um, through a combination of the machine learning and also analysis of searches on this type of data set itself, where people are manually going in and discarding the duplicates, you can get that kind of validation that you need to have uh, high quality duration data. So there are other data sets that are out there that you can do the same type of change analysis. The whole idea is that you want to get um, the vector of change over time in a particular data set. Because once you have that, you can look at any point in time that you want. You don't need to uh, say, oh, I, I wish I had that map from 1873 so that I could take all my data that uh, links up to it. Uh, that's the, the holy grail here. And there are other data sets that I've looked at just in New York City alone that have this kind of um, high value chainable uh, data attribute to them. And there are other data sets in other cities outside of New York that have them or outside of the United States. The, the idea is that you need to be specific in the kind of data sets that you're going after so that you're able to um, uh, arrive at this uh, system that tracks the, the vector of change over time. So, and the link to uh, blockchain is that uh, while you don't often need, so you certainly don't need a crypto system and you often don't need the full implementation of a blockchain-like system to do this, the logic of what blockchain is, is um, what you should be looking for in the types of data sets that you're analyzing. And with that, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there, are, there are a number of use cases. There are, um, there's definitely, you know, scholarly research there's uh, a lot of interest from the genealogical community. You know, if you look at uh, um, services like Ancestry.com 
or things like that. These are services and the users of those services who are looking for high quality historical data. And a lot of times it's um, place related. The, the, the Interest from the genealogical community in historic place data is um, quite high, uh, and so and because it's something that people are willing to pay for, uh, they have often been the drivers of bringing a lot of these data sets um, to the forefront. You know, they've the genealogical services have paid for a lot of the digitization that's gone on so far. What hasn't happened, and I'm not sure that it necessarily will from that standpoint is taking it the next step of um, extracting a lot of the metadata from what's already been digitized uh, because it's not necessarily uh, you know, their use case. All right, thank you everyone.